Thank you, Carly. Um, and good afternoon. Um, before we begin, I would like to let everyone know that this session is being recorded. Um, these recordings will become available on our website post session. Um, we are excited um, to have all of you join us for the 13th Denteco. Uh, my name is Kato, and I will be assisting and um, facilitating today's session. Um, for those who may be new to ECHO, this is a model that builds virtual communities of practice and learning. Um, sessions begin with a didactic presentation followed by a de-identified case-based learning and group discussion to foster deep knowledge and build individual capacity. Before we move on to introductions, a um, few IT-related reminders. Please stay muted unless you're speaking. You can use star six on your phone if you've called in or the microphone icon on the bottom left corner of your screen if you've joined on a computer. You can also communicate with a chat feature. Uh, please rem remember that no personal health information is allowed when discussing cases and scenarios. Uh, we are recording these sessions and we'll make them available after the sessions. If you okay. would like to. Oh. Are you, are you, uh... I, are you hearing me? Yes. Okay. Now let's see. And um, Dr. Amici, I'm going to do a few and more announcements and then I will <laughs> turn it over to you. <laughs> okay. Um, are you still stream seeing my screen? No, not that not at this moment. Okay, let's go for it now. Um Dr. Amici. And um, if you can wait for just a few more minutes, I will ask you to start sharing after the introductions of, of our hub team. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then also just a few more announcements. Um, if you would like to view closed captioning for this session, um, please navigate to the bottom of your Zoom window and select the show captions option. Um, you may need to click on more at the bottom right corner of your Zoom screen to find this menu. Um, if you're having um, trouble accessing captions or you're having any IT issues, please chat our um, Echo IT Carly. Um, and then let's move on to um, introductions. Um, Dr. Chala. Hello and welcome to all of you. Thank you for taking the time out to attend this important session. I'm Suman Chala and uh, I serve as the Advanced Education Director uh, for UT Health San Antonio Dental Schools. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Um, Aguilar. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Rosalie. Thank you so much for joining our Dent Echo today. I'm part of the Dent Echo team. Kathleen. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Kathleen Weeks, and I'm very excited to join the Dent Echo team as a co director. Thank you for taking the time to join us today as we hear from Dr. Amici. And Dr. Amici. Thank you for coming for the session. Uh, it, yeah, it's my honor to be able to present to you. Uh, I'm Dr. Ben Amechi. I'm a professor at, uh, in the Department of Comprehensive Dentistry at the University of Health, uh, UT Health San Antonio here. Thank you for coming. And a few more. Oh, and then I see Professor De La Torre. Uh, we're doing introductions. Hi, hello everyone. Welcome to our session today for Dent Echo. We appreciate your attendance. Thank you. And a few more announcements. Um, to everyone who's joined this session, please enter your name, title, and affiliation into the chat to help us with attendance. And if you haven't already completed the pre-session questionnaire, um, you can do this now using the link in the chat box. Um, to receive CDE credits, registration is required through the UT Health CDE website. We will also follow up by email with instru instructions for completing the post-session evaluation and attaining your credits post-session. Um, ECHO is an all teach, all learn supportive model and ECHOs thrive on the interaction from the full learning network. So we encourage all to participate in the conversation today. We also encourage you to join by video if you can, especially during um, discussion portion of the session at the end. Our session today will include a didactic and uh, presentation from Dr. Amici on Carrie's Care International Practice Guide the modern patient-focused approach to caries management pathways. Um, and as a reminder, you can use the chat to raise questions and comments at any point during the session. Um, and that's it from me, um, Dr. Amici. Uh, whenever you're ready, please um, 
take it away. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Okay. As um, as the moderator said, I'm going to talk on Kiri's Care International Practice Guide uh, as the modern patient-focused approach to Kiri's management pathway. Actually, this is a full two hours talk, but um, now uh, I have to be fast to be able to deliver it in uh, 50 minutes. So you have to bear with me. <laughs> okay. Now, if you look at this beautiful mouth we are looking at here, you will see that the patient with this mouth have attended the dentist for, are you seeing my cursor? Yes, Hello? we can see, can see do you, that. Do you see my cursor? Uh, not right now, no. Okay. Um, maybe we have to... Uh, anyway, so let me try moving let, your cursor one more time. Move it. Okay. 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 Let me continue. I may not even need the cursor much. Okay. If you look at this mouth, you will be wondering what is happening here. Is it the fault of the patient or is it the dentist negligence? Obviously, looking at this mouth, I can tell you that dentist's hand is in this. This patient has attended to a dentist before who placed the amalgam restorations there. But you can see that this patient has no clue that he's supposed to brush his or her teeth. And because of that, the plaques continue accumulating. You see that the, even the amalgam restoration that was placed there is now breaking down due, uh, by secondary caries. And you have new caries lesion for, forming in number, three, uh, number two, and then cavitated one in number three, and then the secondary caries and breakdown of previous restorations. This simply shows that the dentist that placed this amalgam is the typical dentist who will open the patient's mouth, look for cavity, fill the cavity, and discharge the patient. And this is what we describe as putting a new roof on a burning house without quenching the fire first. And this is exactly the, the cycle that shows what they do. You they open the mouth, the third cavity not really carries, and then they will put the restoration. There is no risk that no assessment of the risk status of the patient. The pre, no prevention will be discussed with the patient. So the uh, no risk based prevention is applied. So the next thing that will happen is that what we see in that mouth will happen. The new, the restored uh, lesions will break down, the restorations will break down, new lesions will form, early lesions at the beginning will go cavitated, and it continues like that till the tooth, some of the tooth ended up being removed by extraction. So today, we want, we are moving towards the new paradigm shift toward in dentistry. Where we, want, where we want the dentist to think otherwise and change their method of practice. Because we know that caries is like every other disease. Every disease has risk factors. Genetic factors are just modifiers of the disease. Even the environmental factors are modifiers of the disease. They modify the severity of the disease. Not at, they are not actually the cause of the disease. So if you want to treat any disease, you start by eliminating the risk factors. And that is exactly how caries will be treated. And from the nature, what we know about caries today, we know that bacteria is involved, diet is involved, 
the nature of the tooth, whether it is well mineralized or whether it has a developmental anomaly that is breaking it down is involved. Fluoride and saliva present modifies the extent of the caries. And we know today that caries is reversible. If you capture it early, you can reverse it. And we know today that it's preventable and it's a curable disease. And based on all these factors we know about caries, we formulate what we call caries balance or imbalance. If, pro, if the protective, if you if it consists of the protective factors and the risk factors, if the protective factors are more than the risk factors, caries will not develop. But caries develop and progress when the risk factors is, uh, go, uh, is greater than the protective factors. So our advice to our patient will always be geared towards increasing the protective factors. And as I said, caries is a curable and preventive disease. The simple way to cure it and to prevent it is by changing the local biochemistry of the oral environment to the one that do not support the growth of plaque and the one that does not produce acid to demineralize the two. And this can be achieved simply by changing the oral hygiene attitude of the patient and changing the dietary attitude of the patient, making sure that the patient use, uh, is, uh, use enough fluoride uh, in, during the oral hygiene procedures and making sure that the patient has enough uh, saliva flow. Saliva has a very protective effect against caries. If you can get the patient, uh, your patient to have adequate uh, adequate supply or uh, to have all these four factors here, obviously you will have a caries-free person. So based on this, we know that the best preventive strategy will appear to be an assessment of your patient's caries risk factors prior to the treatment. And in order to develop a pro, um, a protocol that will enable the caries risk factors to be assessed before treatment. Some, some years ago, we gathered together in Guy's Hospital, London, and developed this protocol we call the Caries Care International. We call it Caries Care International 4D because it's made up of four parts. The first, you determine, then second, you detect, and then uh, the, the third, you decide, you synthesize the information and decide your treatment plan. And then the fourth part, which is do, you do the treatment, okay? So, and the aim of this Caries Care International is to develop a system that is comprehensive, patient-centered, biologically compatible, evidence-based and preventive-oriented and safe for the tooth structure which is focused on providing better, uh, better care and better health at a low cost. And the mission is to preserve dental tissue first and restore only when indicated. So in, in addition to that, there is a, a fifth part, which is always measuring your treatment outcomes. So which is added recently, emphasizing it so that the dentist should try to uh, measure their treatment outcome uh, when the on completion of all the treatments. Now let's go to the risk assessment. What is caries risk assessment? This is the cl clinical process of establishing the probability of an individual patient to develop caries lesions over a certain period of time and or the likelihood that there will be a change in severity or activity of lesions already present. Now, what is the importance? Why do we do risk, uh, caries risk assessment? You assess the risk of an, it assess the risk of an individual patient for future development of disease. It identifies the individual etiology factors contributing to the existing disease and which can exacerbate the risk. It provides a basis to explain, the patient, uh, explain to the patient how to prevent the dental disease and communicate and facilitate needed change in behavior to prevent future disease. And when you repeat, repeat it, the repeated assessment of the risk allows an evaluation of the success or the need for modification of the preventive measures you, add, you apply. And it, an indication of an increased risk for disease in a population will allow 
selection of individual preventive programs. And from experience, we know that the pass carries experience of a patient is the greatest or the strongest risk indicator for future disease development. Now, if you look at this patient, this is a 25 years old patient who works night shift in a convenience store selling gas, snack foods, and sweetened pork, uh, pork that is uh, soda. Uh, free beverage, you can see that she has access to free beverage consumption, which is available to workers. Then the patient's medical history includes depression and anxiety, antidepressant and anti-anxiety medications used for several years. The patient failed on the first appointment for an examination, keep the, keep the second appointment and failed the third appointment. The patient is slightly overweight, otherwise healthy. The patient has extensive caries destruction. Now, you are care for this patient. If you look at this patient's mouth and the whole history, you can see that you are care for this patient will be substandard if you don't take Risk, assess risk assessment, because the risk assessment will reveal these factors you need in planning the care of that patient. It will tell you about the high frequency and high consumption of sugary beverages and snack, inconsistent oral hygiene due to work schedule, no history of restorative care, medication-induced dry mouth, low socioeconomic status, tick plaque accumulation, lack of adequate fluoride exposure, and low compliance because she misses her appointment due to her work schedule. And because of that, he has all classes of caries, initial caries, moderate and extensive active caries. These are the informations that if you don't do risk assessment, obviously you will miss two or three of these informations. And you need all of them in order to give the complete and adequate care for this patient. And how do we do this risk assessment? We use this form which we now currently incorporated into our software, clinical software. So the form is made up of four parts, the questionnaire part, then the, the questionnaire part, which is on top. And on the left-hand side, you have the objective part where you use the information you gather from your clinical examination and then from your questionnaire to fill up that part. And the third part is the uh, object, the assessment part where you decide the risk status of the patient. And on the right-hand side is where you plan your preventive treatment. So in our, in this circle, uh, three, uh, caries management, 3D, 4D caries management, all these parts are represented by, like the questionnaire part is represented by the determine. And then the, the detection part, represent the oral, intraoral part where you do clinical examination and then um, list what is um, what you find. And then the decide part represent the assessment part where you synthesize all the information you gather from the determine and detect and then formulate your treatment plan, which is should be personalized for that patient. So, the information we gather with the, on the questionnaire part are whether the patient have something like head and neck irradiation, which you know that it kills the salivary cells and therefore the patient has dry mouth. Apart from head and neck irradiation, the dry mouth can be caused by medications or recreational drugs, or it can be self-reported by the patient, you know, we, also, uh, the, we always emphasize on medication because if you look at this table here, every medication in blue causes xerostomia, dry mouth. And based on that, 85% of the medications people take causes dry mouth. That will show you the level of people that are suffering from dry mouth. So apart from that, you get information like inadequate oral hygiene practices, deficient exposure to topical fluoride, high frequency or an amount of sugary drinks and snack, symptomatic driven dental attendance, socioeconomic status, and for children, high caries experience of the parents or caregiver, which influences their own caries status. Now, 
After, after that, then we go to the detect and assess part, which we call the intraoral caries risk factors of caries risk assessment, which is the second part in our form. This, this part, the first part is uh, detecting caries and staging the caries. You stage the caries into initial, moderate, and extensive caries. So if you look at it, this is publication by ADA. ADA, this, the normal, if you look down there, you will see where I wrote ICDAS. ICDAS 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. This ICDAS is the International Carriage Detection and Assessment System, which was developed solely to incorporate the uh, management of early carries and prevention in carries management. But ADA look at these six or uh, seven factor classifications. They say that this is too much for private practice, that all they needed, we have to classify it according to management. So they come up with initial carries, which is non-cavitated carries. The moderate carries consist of breakage, when there is breakage, but limited to inner male, or when there is shadow. That shadow, that shadow around the pits and fissures, which we know that it means that the dentin underneath is eaten up by caries. Then any, any cavitation that gets into dentin is classified as advanced or extensive caries because this determines the management. Then now, if you look at the initial caries, the problem that the dentists are having with the initial caries is the fact that it is the first clinical sign of caries development, which is usually white spot. And you know that it's not only caries that causes white spot. Developmental defect, developmental anomalies present hypo, developmental hypomineralization present as white spots. So I always give these factors to my students to use it to differentiate between white spots, which is due to developmental anomaly and the one that did due to caries. So for caries, caries always appears opaque, chalky and dull surface. When you air dry it, it always feel rough when the tip of explorer, blunt end of the explorer is moved gently across the surface. And it is always, you always have S36 stain, which can be easily removed with your explorer. And it's usually caries, white spots due to caries are usually located at uh, plaque stagnation areas. But developmental anomalies, they're always very shiny. The surface is shy, glossy, very shiny when you uh, dry it. It feels smooth when the tip of explorer is moved across it. You cannot see S36 stain. If it is discolored, the discolors will be intrinsic stain underneath the enamel, and then it's located mainly in self-cleansing uh, area. You can see it there. So back to the our diagram again, you will see that apart from the clinical appearance of the caries, there is radiographic. You will also take the radiograph in order to look at the proximal caries, so, which are usually located underneath the contact point. So for you to make a decision whether a lesion is initial, moderate, or advanced caries, you must combine the radiographic appearance and the clinical appearance. So if you look at this table, even if your clinical appearance is showing that the surface is sound, but the radiograph is showing you that there is initial caries. Because the radiograph, if you look at the radiograph, you see that the radiograph was also classified into initial, moderate, and advanced caries. So even if the radiographs tell you initial caries, you take it to be initial caries. You always trump to the higher one. If the clinical says initial and radiograph said moderate, take it to be moderate. So we always trump, trump to the higher uh, category. So these are some examples of the initial caries on smooth surfaces. And this is initial caries on occlusal surfaces. This is the most difficult part because most dentists will call this uh, stain. You know, that the, this uh, pits and fissures are stained. But um, obviously, we teach our students the best way to, uh, to differentiate 
between stained pits and fissures and then pits and fissures that are carried, early carried. I cannot go into that differentiation now because of time. Then this example of moderate carries on smooth surfaces, you can see that it's broken down, but it's, the breakage is limited to enamel. And then you can see on the occlusal surface too. So the difference is that in this one is broken, but it's lim the breakage is limited to enamel. Uh, then you, you have um, the extensive one, which is the breakage is, has gone down to dentin. Now, the, the, after the uh, categorization of the caries, you now go back to the early caries. You have to decide the activity status of the early caries, whether they are active or inactive, because it is only the active ones that you need to go ahead and treat by remarization. So I also give my students the points to use to differentiate between active and inactive. An active caries is always chalky and dull when you dry it and feels rough when the explorer is moved uh, over it always. But inactive is always shiny when you dry it, but it can be rough or smooth depending on how long it has lasted in the mouth. If it has lasted for long, it can be smooth because the mastication and movement of tongue will smoothen it. But if it is still early, it will, it will be rough, but shiny, showing you that it's inactive. So other factors that we look at in trioral risk assessment is hyposalivation, carries the experience of the patient, tick plaque, because tick, the presence of plaque, tick plaque on the surface of the tooth is actually what is correlated to um, the DMFT of the patient. That is the carries the experience of the patient. It is not bacteria. Some people will tell you measuring bacteria level. Bacteria level has not been correlated to the level of caries in patient's mouth, but the presence of plaque is what has actually good correlation. Then appliances, false restorations, and other causes of increased uh, biofilm retention, and then exposed roots. These are the intraoral factors can increase their caries. Then after that, you now gather all the information you get from this determine and detect part and then synthesize them and decide your personalized treatment care for this patient. And the, but first of all, with that, you can determine the caries risk status of the patient, whether the patient is at a low, moderate, or high caries status, because that will determine the treatment, you, that will determine the level of treatment you will give. You will we see it in the next few slides. And this is what uh, I usually give the students because it's a summary of ADA recommendation. For somebody to be in low carry status, there shouldn't be any carries at all, whether cavitated or non-cavitated, and no single factor that is promoting carries risk. And then for moderate, for children younger than six years, no caries at all, but presence of at least one factor that promote caries risk, you put the person at moderate. For adults, one or two white spots or cavitated primary or secondary caries, and, um, or there is no uh, caries at all, or at least the presence of at least one factor that may increase caries risk. But once, uh, if, the, if a child has any white spot or both whether cavitated caries or not, that child goes to high caries risk. But for adults, three or more white spots or cavitated primary or secondary caries is what we put the, patient, the adult to a high caries risk. And or multiple caries promoting factors or inadequate exposure to fluoride. And then, and then when we, I always like to highlight this xerostomia because in some states like California, once you, are in, once you have dry mouth, they put you in another level, which they call um, uh, uh, the, either greater, greater high or, or they, you have a upper, they usually have an upper, upper level again, which is more than high or they call it extensive high. 
once you have dry mouth, because that is a very serious problem. So with this classification, you determine the patient's uh, status. And that will lead you to now decide the treatment plan for your patient, the care, personalized care plan for that patient. But the most important thing is here is that that plan must always have these four areas. They are must make, you must make provision for preventing new caries developing on sound enamel. If you must make provision for non-operative care of non-cavitated lesions, that is initial lesions. Then you must have provision for tooth preserving operative care of cavitated lesions. We note that we say tooth preserving, not just operative care, but tooth preserving operative care. We show you an example of that. And then the fourth is that you must make provision for recall visits. Because if the, if the dentist that treated this patient has made provision for recall visit, he would have seen that the patient is, was not a compliant with his or her advice, if he has given advice at all. And he, he will see all these new lesions developing when they were developing at, at the early stage and then control it. But it means that the dentists have no provision for a call visit. And that is what uh, led to this deterioration. So another thing we brought in, in, as I said, is the outcome measure. When you have finished the whole treatment of your patient and after a few uh, recall visits, you have to measure the outcome of your treatment, which I will show you in the next few slides. However, before then, for caries, care man in a caries management guide, establishment of the right protocols and selection of the right product can help protect your patient. I will not go into pro, uh, protocol. I will just show you the example of the protocols we use here in our dental school. For example, we, this is the protocol we have for occlusal or fissured surfaces. If there is no, if the person have deep pits and fissures, but the person is no caries at all. So, if the patient is at a low caries risk, you don't need to do anything because the patient is good, keep uh, brushing the teeth very well and maintaining good oral hygiene. But if the patient happens to be on moderate or high caries risk, you must seal, you must put sealant for those pits and fissures to protect them from new caries. But if there is any sign of caries, early caries or moderate caries in those pits and fissures, you also put sealant there. And some other things we will discuss that you uh, later. There are but not only sealant, there are other things you can do now. Then if there is obvious cavitation, then you do restoration. So this is how we apply caries risk assess assessment or caries risk status of the patient for doing a uh, management. In this case, if you look at it, this is proximal caries. Once you are, it is only at the enamel level, we call it E2 or E1 or E2. If the patient is at a moderate or high caries risk, you do remarization. As long as the caries is not broken, no cavitation, you can do a remarization. Obviously, you did not see low caries risk here because anybody that has this caries can never be at a low risk. Then here, if it's already in D1, which is the first, uh, upper one third, outer one third of the dentin, if the patient is moderate, you can do remarization, but high, you do restoration. And anything more than that, you do restoration. So we have the same protocol for non-prosimal uh, non uh, smooth surface, which is the prosimal surface. And we have protocol for root caries, all based on the a caries risk status of the patient. So after that, then we now let's go to that management, the risk based prevention, which is what we are promoting. If you look at here, if somebody at a low caries risk, all you need, it means that the patient is doing very well with uh, protecting his or her or, uh, teeth. So all you have to do is to encourage them to continue brushing twice a day with the normal uh, level of fluoride, which is the standard level of fluoride in toothpaste, which is 1100 ppm. Uh, then you encourage them to 
continue doing the good things they are doing. Then for you as a dentist, you do your motivation to encourage them. But to recall visits will be 12 to 24 months. We will get to that later. Then if the patient is at a moderate caries rate, the home care should be general behavior modification in oral health. The, floor, the toothpaste the patient should be using should be increased fluoride content, about 1450 ppm. And then you have to add fluoride mouth range to that. And then for, for the your clinical intervention should involve regular prophylaxis and fluoride vanish or gel application twice a year, every year. Then engage in dietary counseling, hypomela. If the patient has hyposalivation, you have to do the hyposalivary uh, stimulation counseling. Records will be six to 12 months. Then if the, for those at a high caries risk, you have to increase the awareness of the caries risk behaviors. In addition to what you did for somebody at moderate risk, you have to increase the awareness of the risk factors to the patient. And then for you, your own intervention, fluoride vanish or gel should be four times a year as opposed to two times for moderate caries. And the recall should start from three months. So, this is the ADA recommendation when it comes to um, recall uh, visit, the, for the, when it comes to fluoride vanish application. Those at a low caries risk does not need topical fluoride application. They, cannot, they don't need it because they won't benefit anything from it. The moderate, those at moderate risk, children less than six years, vanish every six months, no gel. Adults from six years up vanish or gel every six months. No gel for children because they will swallow it. Then high caries risk, they, say they, they, have, they should have vanish every three months. And for adults, vanish or gel every three months or six months. So going to the moderate, uh, to, to, for treatment of non-cavitated caries. This is where we have problem when it comes to some people in private practice. When they see early caries, which is not yet cavitated, especially on smooth surface, they say watch. They put it with green, watch over time. But why do you need to watch when you know that we have products that you can use to reverse the caries or at least remineralize it or arrest it? Why should you watch it? So we always advocate that once you see it, that is an early stage of the disease, you have to go ahead and arrest it, treat it. And for occlusal surface, if you see early caries on occlusal surface, what we recommend is sealant. You can use sealant and seal it because we know that sealant works very well for pits and fissures. We are 90% of the lesions occur. And if sealant is intact, curious lesions will not progress. Apart from sealant for clusus early lesions, we can use the new kid on the block, which is silver diamine fluoride. We can use the silver diamine fluoride to arrest any early caries on the occlusal surface. The only thing is that silver diamine fluoride will turn the, the, turn the lesion black. But um, that is but its occlusal surface. Obviously, there is no, it's not an aesthetic area, so it can be used. For smooth surfaces and proximal surfaces, there are a lot of things that can be used fluoride vanish, gel. Um, coat in a uh, antimicrobial coat or resin infiltration. I will not go into that, but I will show you the publication of the ADA. ADA has this publication, what you can use to treat caries, both uh, non-cavitated and cavitated caries on the occlusal surface, proximal surface and smooth surfaces in primary teeth. They also have the publication for permanent teeth. So you can see that silver diamine fluoride is mentioned both for cavitated and non-cavitated caries. The, it can only be used for non-cavitated or non-aesthetic areas. So there are a lot of products that can be used to manage non-early initial caries. Okay, coming to the cavitated caries, I stated that the recommendation is tooth-preserving operative care of the lesion. 
And this is, is just a simple, this is what we mean by tooth, operate, tooth preserving operative care of the lesion. If, you, if there is caries on those uh, uh, brown spots, when I was in dental school, what we were taught is that we have to make a cavity, a cavity that we include all pits and fissures on that tooth surface. But you can see that this is a total waste of sound tooth. But so nowadays we don't do that. As in this dental school, we don't do that any longer because that method is called the GV black method. It is obsolete, it's no longer used. What we do here is that we remove caries on the area that we have caries, say, uh, do restore the, uh, the cavity where we remove the caries, and then the rest of the remaining pits and fissures, we seal it with sealant. Okay, and now that we have a uh, silver diamine fluoride, we can even use silver diamine fluoride in place of uh, sealant. Now, some people will ask you, there, there, is, there are needs sometimes that you have to arrest cavitated caries instead of restoring it. For adults, you can arrest, because of the presence of silver diamine fluoride, we know that we can use it to arrest the cavitated caries while waiting for opportunity or time for restoration in multiple caries situations. And we can also use it for root caries in posterior and lower anteriors, which are non-aesthetic areas. For children, you can use the silver diamine fluoride when, the, when they are a severe early childhood caries and, or early childhood caries, which is they have multiple caries, which they usually take them to theater under GA and remove all the teeth. But this time around, the recommendation is that why not arrest the lesions with silver diamine fluoride? You use it where, while they are waiting for opportunity for G, G, uh, general anesthesia or to have, use it to avoid subjecting them to general anesthesia, especially in uh, special needs children. They are why they are waiting for opportunity or time for restoration. So silver diamine fluoride has, uh, is doing a lot of good in the clinic as of now to help with these uh, uh, children. Because we know that when you apply it, the silver the, uh, it, the penetrates into the tooth tissue. Not only that it stays, it, it, it hardens the, the cavitated lesion immediately. It hardens the, the, the softened dentin and the demineralized enamel. It hardens it instantly. It also have a reservoir of silver, which is antimicrobial. So plaque cannot even accumulate on the surface of that lesion again. So you can have further demineralization. And, but the problem is the fact that it turns, it stains the tooth, it turns the tooth uh, black. But now, if it is in a cavitated lesion, you can just excavate, you can just do a little excavation, put the silver diamine fluoride, and then cover it with glass ionomer. As long as you don't cure it, put the self, use self-curing glass ionoma, you don't cure it. Once you cure it with the light, the, the whole thing will turn black. But if you don't cure it, put the glass ionoma, it will cover the stain. There is a publication that potassium iodide can reduce the staining, but it, it, can, it does, but no, it cannot last for more than six months. So it doesn't work. And the FDA does not accept it. So after that, the next one is the one thing that many dentists don't do, which is the recall, the recall visit. What is recall? A recall system is a continued care regime which provides opportunities to reassess and monitor the oral health status of the patient or to, to assess the status of a previously diagnosed and treated disease, to monitor patient compliance with the previous advice and treatment, to detect any newly developed disease, and to encourage patient behavior that will improve and maintain their oral and general health, to monitor patient's compliance with the previous advice and treatment. Uh, we doing okay. Yeah to enable the clinician to consider altering the treatment regimen to obtain more favorable outcome, 
and to provide evidence for future clinical governance and quality improvement services. Now, there, there are some evidence that recall visits have positive impact on the natural and functional dentition. But one thing I want to say is that there is insufficient evidence to support or refute the practice of encouraging patients to attend for dental checkups at six monthly interval. Because this is what students always ask me when I tell them this patient is high caries risk, therefore three months. This patient is moderate, therefore 12 months. They ask me what of the six monthly visit for oral hygiene. I tell them there is no evidence supporting that. That is what actually led to determination of a recall interval because there is no evidence for this six monthly visit. And the, the probe started in Britain because we know that in Britain, they have NI, N, NHS, which is free dental care for everybody. So every six months, this is costing the government a lot of money. So they probed into it and determined that six months is not for everybody. Your interval should be determined by your risk status. So there is complete lack of high quality research to properly inform clinical practice on timing of recall visits. So the, this institute, UK National Institute of Health and Clinical Excellence decided to research into it and then determine how to determine the recall visit for each patient. And the conclusion is that the, the recall interval should be based on the age, caries risk status, and non heart tissue issues of the patient. These three things will determine the interval. And what they determine is that those who are zero to 18 years, low caries risk, the interval should start from six to 12, for, uh, then moderate caries, six months, and then high caries, three months. For those 18 years plus, low caries 12 to 24, moderate 6 to 12, and high caries 3 to 6 years. So for practical reasons, the patient should be assigned a recall interval starting from three, three months. If the patient is complying with advice, then you move it to six months, nine months, or 12 months for those who are below 18 years. For then those above 18 and above, you start from three, six, nine, just like that. So the longest recall interval for somebody below 18 years should be 12 months. And the longest recall interval for adult 18 and above should be 24 months, depending on risk status of the patient. And at every visit, you have to review the behavioral modification and counseling you gave and you have to reassess all the lesions and all the treatments you did. And then there should be, you have to redo the risk assessment. To redo your risk assessment to know the current risk status of the patient, which will determine the recall interval at that point. And also you modify the behavioral goals. If the patient has, the risk status have changed, you modify your, you change your behavioral goal. So, so after that, the last part will be the uh, measurement of the treatment outcome. It is advised that at a certain stage when you have completed your treatment, you have to measure your treatment outcome. And this is a simple chart to use, simple question. Is the quality of your care satisfactory to your patient? Has the patient quality of life changed or that's improved? And is the disease controlled and can the patient maintain his or her health? And if you look at your quality of life, we know we have oral health um, related quality of life scale. There are a scale for measuring oral health related quality of life. So yeah, ideally, you're supposed to actually do it when the, before you start treating the patient so that after completing your treatment, you redo it to know if there is improvement in their quality of life. For example, if the patient has anxiety attending to, uh, dental, to the dentist, has the anxiety reduced or remained the same? Then disease control, has the disease been controlled? So you check for the active, moderate, and extensive lesions that you treated. Is the quality acceptable to the patient? And the active non-cavitated caries, are they controlled? 
uh, the, that the lesions are rested, then no new non cavitated lesions developing, no new moderate or extensive caries. Then behavioral outcomes, the oral hygiene outcome, no heavy plaque accumulation, which you have to measure with the dual discoloring system. Dietary goal, was it met? The dietary advice you gave to the patient, is it working? Does the, pa is the patient compliant to it? Then tobacco cessation, if the patient is using tobacco, did the patient agree to quit and did he or she quit it? Then you review, uh, you review the recall goals and check whether the recall goals were met. Okay, now the most, the, the most important thing is that one thing I will mention about recall is that when we are setting up that recall visit, we, we must recall in TAVA, we must discuss with the patient to know if there is any barrier that we prevent them from coming for recall visit, such as transportation or finance, transport finance, all that. That will also cause them not to attend. Okay, thank you so much. I know I was very fast, but um, it's a lot of information. Okay. Is there any question? Thank you so much, Dr. Amici. Um, I actually see one question in the chat um, and we, I, I can start off with that. Um, so this is from Martha. Um, is only one application of SVF enough before restoring with glass ionomer? Uh, the, current, um, the current protocol is twice. Thank you. Um, and are there any questions? Um, well, no, you said applica putting glass ionomer. Actually, glass mm -hmm. ionomer should be put immediately on the first, the, once you apply it, and it dries up, you put glass ionoma because the glass ionoma is to cover the blackness. It's just for aesthetic reasons. The, the, the therapeutic treatment is from, is from glass, silver diamond fluoride. Glass ionoma it has very good aesthetics. So it is used to cover the, the stain and nothing more. So at any time the patient come and you apply the uh, silver diamond fluoride, you cover it. Uh, with a glass ionomer. Thank you for that. Does anybody have? Um... The protocol of twice a year is when you are using it to arrest cavitated caries. Maybe in children, you don't want to extract the tooth. Or when you are waiting to have time for the patient to have money for restoration, you use it to arrest the cavitated lesion. And in that case, you have to put it twice every year. Thank you. Um, does anybody have any questions for Dr. Amiti? Any general questions or questions regarding the, the didactic presentation? Uh, uh, was I too fast? <laughs> I was very informative and <laughs> covering a lot of slides in yes. limited time. Thank you. Um, any questions from the Learning Network? I see a question from Christine. Any value to baseline pH testing of saliva? Um, I don't think um, I don't think there is, there is much value to it because actually the pH, the acidity that is causing caries or that causing demineralization, which is caries, is actually the acidity of the plaque. The acidity of saliva hardly does that because saliva is, is flowing continuously. Even the, it's flowing, the only way the acidity of the saliva affects the tooth demineralization is in a high acidity from extrinsic uh, uh, source, like when you drink Coca-Cola or orange juice. The acidity of that will increase the acidity of the saliva. And in that case, it is then to tooth wear. It will cause erosion not a uh, caries, but the acidity that causes caries is the acidity of the plaque.
I remember when so many years ago we used to have students do the saliva testing for their student or for their patients. Yes, years yes. ago here at our yes. school. Yeah. And uh, and some some people do salivary testing just to test the to measure the amount of bacteria in oral environment. Again, studies stu studies have shown that the amount of bacteria in saliva does not correlate to the in the oral environment or in general does not correlate to the kiri status of the patient. What actually determines the presence of kiris is the plaque, the presence of plaque. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, any more comments, questions? Um, Dr. Amich, I, I had one while listening to your presentation. Um, what are some ways that you can encourage um, the patients to, to do preventative care, like preventative behaviors? What it, I, I feel like that's very difficult <laughs> to yes. motivate them to do it. Yeah, that's a very good question because that is why you should have a recall visit so that you, you take your time and advise the patient, telling them what to do. And you have, especially those at the high caring risk status, you have to want to see them in three months to know how compliant they are with your advice. Okay, so it takes a lot of time to advise them and days are gone. When I was in dental school and those early days, we have a lot of leaflets. You just, they just see patients, they give them leaflets and do go and read leaflets and follow the instructions in leaflets. And I can tell you most of those leaflets end up in our trash in that dental school. It ends up in that trash. No, but they don't, even if they take it home, they never read it. So you have to sit them down and use what actually we, it led to development of what we call a motivational interview. Yeah, now we use what we call motivational interview. You sit the patient down, you a sort of dialogue with the patient. The patient you tell the patient the things that can uh, prevent the caries and let the patient decide the one he or she can do. So you take it gradually. You don't bombard them with everything. Oh, you should stop doing this, stop doing this, stop doing this. You know, you, you dialogue with them. They come to agreement, tell you the ones they can start with. And then when they come on recall visit, you can, if you see that compliant with that, then you add the next one, just gradually like that. It is called motivational interviewing. And that is the technique that is used now. And we teach it to our students. Dr. Faroki teaches it to our students, motivational interviewing. Mm. So you take it slow and, and think yes, about Yes, one, one by one, one, one step at a time. Okay. The importance of recall as well. Um, before, oh, and um, I see a question from, from Rico. Do you still advise using an explorer or probe for detecting caries? Explorer is very important. It's an momentum for uh, for caries detection, but it depends on the way you use it. What we what ADA refused that it can no longer be used for is in, when I was in dental school, I was trained that for me to detect caries, whether there is caries in pits and fissures, you know, closed pits and fissures, I have to stick their sharp explorer to it, but that it gives you false negative information. And also it give, it, when there is um, when there is early carry there, which is not cavitated, your sharp explorer will cavitate it and it can no longer be remarried. So ADA does not want it again. And we tell our students, no more use of sharp explorer to probe pits and fissures. You can use it to clean up. You can use it to the blunt part to move over the surface of the lesion to know whether it is rough or smooth. You can use it to create a scrape of the plaque on the surface of the tooth. Great. Thank you. I see that it's already one. Um, yes. So thank you so much to everybody for joining um, for our 13th Dent Echo. Um, and thank you particularly to Dr. Amici 
for your very informative didactic presentation. Um, please complete the post-session survey. Um, the link should be in the chat. And thank you, Carly, for dropping it in again. And we hope to see you in two months um, for the next Stand Echo. Um, thank you again, and have a great rest of the day.